Hi, welcome back. This is the second half of the last session, session 13. In the first half, we were summarizing the theoretical aspects of the course and matching up some of the theoretical issues involving causation and goals and participants and effects with some realities. In other words, when we talk about class conflict or we talk about nationalism, what are some of the revolutions that illustrate that theory are where it best seems to explain what was going on. Uh, now, in the second half, we're going to do two things. One, I want to talk for a few minutes about revolutions here at the beginning of the 21st century in terms of are we looking at an age where revolutions have ceased to exist, which is one argument, or is there a possibility that revolutions will go on uh, influencing human history in the next century, in the coming years uh, that all of us will experience? Are they going to be years of revolution, potentially, or not? Now, let me point out that historians are the worst people in the world to predict anything. <laughs> all we know is the past. But I do want to talk about some of the implications of both interpretations, both the idea that revolutions uh, have passed, that the age of revolutions was really the last 500 years, the time that we've uh, covered in this course, or the other possibility that at least the potential for revolutions still exists in the modern world. Now, one side of this argument uh, is really based on the idea that revolutions are a good thing. And quite frankly, you know, Thomas Jefferson, as I mentioned at the beginning of the course, thought revolutions were a good thing. He thought that uh, society should experience a revolution about every 10 years or so, uh, which seems a little frequent. But what he had in mind uh, were some of the ideas from the Enlightenment about the ability of human beings to change their society and to make it better. And we talked a little bit about this, uh, the Enlightenment ideas that challenge uh, the old feudal orders in France and elsewhere. Uh, Jefferson was a child of uh, this same intellectual movement and believed that human beings did have the capacity to dramatically alter and improve their own societies and do it sometimes in a radical fashion. So that's why he would see revolutions as something both positive and something likely to occur uh, repeatedly in human history because they were a means of achieving change. Uh, so in some ways there long persisted an argument well into the 20th century about the inevitability of revolutions. And even if you don't buy the ideas of the Enlightenment thinkers about how important they are to improving the world, certainly the historical record of the 20th century strongly suggested that revolutions had a certain inevitability. After all, once you get through the Mexican Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, Vietnamese, Cuban, Nicaraguan, etc., the 20th century has been an age of revolutions. So both on the basis of intellectual argument and on the basis of historical fact, uh, there has seemed to be in the 20th century a sense of inevitability that periodically revolutions would erupt uh, through human history and dramatically alter its course. And that also reflected a belief that revolutions represented major breakthroughs in human history that this in many ways, uh, this phenomena of revolution was a positive aspect of human history. And certainly as we've looked at revolutions, uh, we see that they're not always the product simply of oppression of one kind or another. It is not just, well, gee, the poor are downtrodden and the rich are trotting upon them, <laughs> because that's been true throughout human history. We see that there are a variety of factors that bring about uh, revolutionary change. But nevertheless, there is a belief that revolutions, and there has been a belief that revolutions uh, essentially help rectify uh, problems within a society, you know, structural dysfunction, economic decline, uh, failure to achieve modernization, uh, autocracy in the political order, that these kinds of problems can be rectified and dramatically so by revolutions. So there has been a belief, and certainly there seems to have been evidence uh, in the 20th century as well as in earlier times that revolutions could have uh, a fundamental impact on human history and often help deal with some of the basic problems in human societies. And also that they are a transformational phenomena, as I say here, that they help radically alter societies and usually for the better. Now again, this is one set of arguments I'm giving you. I'll flip to the other side in a minute. But the belief that revolutions are not simply destructive, 
uh, as much as what we envision when we envision the Russian Revolution as the you know, storming of the Winter Palace, and in uh, China it's massed armies of nationalists and Red Army factions uh, battling each other and enormous casualties. Uh, the destruction of revolutions is always readily apparent, but there is also uh, evidence for the idea that these revolutions have transformed these societies. We talked about some of the effects in the first half of the session today about improving economic development, creating more equitable, if not totally equitable and just societies, and so forth and so on, that revolutions can achieve these transformations. They can take societies that seem to have fallen far behind the rest of humanity in their development and suddenly push them forward in a dramatic fashion into achieving some of the goals uh, of uh, modern societies in the sense of economic growth, economic development, and greater participation of their populations in the political process. That all of these are transformations that revolutions seem to be capable of bringing about. Now, that's the upside. Let's look at the downside. <laughs> According to another set of ideas that have become popular at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century, all of this was pretty much unnecessary anyways. Uh, that revolutions are not to be viewed so much as positive developments, as uh, transitional moments, as transformational phenomena, uh, but rather as unfortunate uh, breakdowns in human order. And that, according to this theory, we are now past that process, that we have reached beyond uh, this epoch of breakdown and disruption uh, as a new world order emerges, uh, an era marked by uh, true globalization. And that, that process really marks the end not only of revolutions, but the end of history. Because what history has been about, according to this perspective, is the idea of dramatic and violent change, the rise and fall of empires, revolutions, wars, etc. But that we are moving into an era in which human events will largely be managed by bureaucratic systems and that there will be little in the way of truly violent global upheaval as we have seen in the past, you know, the great world wars, the great revolutions, that all of that is passing because a series of phenomena uh, have emerged that are going to make all of that unnecessary. And that, in fact, some of what we have seen, as even I have suggested, was the product of the emergence of these phenomena. In other words, as capitalism spreads globalization, that they've helped trigger these revolutions. Unfortunate, but now we're past that stage. Now we're into an era where globalization is really coming into its own, where capitalism is triumphing across the globe. And what that means is that as the world becomes more and more a unified economic system, as trade and investment barriers fall, now, you have the establishment of the World Trade Organization, uh, which was the successor to the General Agreement on uh, Tariffs uh, and Trade. As all of this happens, uh, the world is becoming integrated, not necessarily uniform, but integrated, in, uh, certainly in its economic processes, so that we will have, in many ways, a single global economy. Yes, distinct in some ways, but uh, that all economies ultimately will be like the United States, that will, they will be intimately linked by investment and trade with economies around the globe, uh, that the whole world will consist of these heavily linked and integrated economic systems. Not uniform, but deeply integrated. Furthermore, not only will this be a system that is heavily interlinked, but it will be one which is following essentially the same pattern of development and growth. And of course here, uh, people who argue this look towards revolutions and the outcomes of those revolutions in places like China and Russia. And they will say, see what has happened, Mexico? That we have a series of societies, despite revolutionary change, despite Maoism and Bolshevism, that all of these societies, are moving essentially in the same direction of capitalism. Now, it may be a state-directed capitalism, such as in, uh, in all of three of these, really, there have strong elements of state direction. But nevertheless, more and more economies that are focused not on 
the state development of the economy, but state management of the economy, and that more and more of the initiative for economic change and growth is coming from the private sector. So in the end, for all the revolutions and the talk of communism and uh, you know, Islamic republics, in the end, uh, we're all going to be following the same economic model anyways, one version or another of capitalism. Here, with more state control in places like Russia and China uh, and Iran, uh, over here or Mexico in the United States and elsewhere, far more uh, decentralized systems where the state has less control over the economy, less of direct investment and control in it. But in the end, we're all going to be doing the same thing. We all are doing the same thing. We're following the same basic model. Everybody's bought into it. So what would possibly be the reason for change in these situations since we're all following the same model? And not only is this true in economics, but it's true in politics. That more and more, the Western ideas of liberalism, and here I'm referring specifically to ideas about elected representative government, uh, that are the foundations of governments in places like the United States and England and France and Germany and uh, now um, Japan and India, etc., where you have elected representatives and where allegedly one person, one vote dominates and issues are decided by debates among elected representatives and an executive branch, that these basic ideas of liberalism and of the protection of individual rights and of the importance of the individual, that that is becoming the norm in human societies. Uh, that despite what may have appeared to be the case at mid-century, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, with the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, etc., that that wave of totalitarian regimes, etc., uh, has been crashed upon the shore and is now dissipating. And what we have instead is the emergence more and more of these liberal systems, variations upon the basic structure created in the West some centuries ago with the British Parliament and with the French Republic, etc. And what better evidence of this change than the kinds of dramatic political events that we have seen in the last 25 or 30 years. Look at the collapse of the Soviet Union, the most significant communist power in the world at that time, the major nuclear power among the socialist bloc, and yet by the end of the 1980s, uh, it had essentially collapsed, it had disintegrated, and certainly communism had disappeared as the dominant force in Russia, although the Communist Party remains a significant part of the Russian political reality. Nevertheless, Russia is no longer a communist nation, a communist society. And of course, with the end of the Soviet Union came the collapse of the regimes in Eastern Europe, such as those in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary, uh, that were also communist and heavily influenced and even dominated by the Soviet Union. So we've seen clearly the political collapse of communism uh, in its state form uh, throughout the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And this also has brought an end uh, to the Cold War in the sense that we no longer envision a conflict dividing the world between communism on the one hand and capitalism on the other side, uh, communist states versus capitalist states. Yes, China uh, still asserts its presence as a communist nation, but many would argue it's not really, you know, communist. It's more state capitalism. It's just the Communist Party still calls it communism. And when the United States uh, debates China, it is over basic issues of trade, issues of influence and control over Taiwan, but most of this has very little in the way of a true ideological tinge. It's much more of the idea of competing nation states, China and the United States, rather than the idea that there is some fundamental ideological divide, as was so obvious in the conflict with the Soviet Union throughout the second half, or through much of the second half of the 20th century. So all of that, the, the great ideological issues are gone. And this is uh, one of the keys to this argument, that we no longer see a world influenced by great ideological debate and differences. You know, this great chasm between communism and capitalism, uh, between communist regimes and capitalist regimes, or democratic regimes as we would uh, term it, that all of that has disappeared. That there is no such conflict anymore. The great debates are over. The great ideological debates that somehow humanity is going to follow one of these paths or the other has already been determined. And we now know 
here at the beginning of the 20th first century that communism is kaput and, and capitalism and democracy, liberalism uh, are triumphant and it's just a matter of how long will it take for them to spread and influence the rest of the globe. And another example of this would be the end of dictatorships in Latin America. That, uh, in the last 20 years, the dictatorial regimes that had become predominant in that part of the world in the 1960s and 70s uh, and early 1980s have largely collapsed and given way to elected governments. So here again, we see this triumph of liberalism, of elected representative governments. So the great issues are past us. And instead, what we will have are a series of bureaucracies managing the system of development. The, the debates are now over, well, gee, should we have interest rates at 6% or 5%? Uh, how rapidly should the economy grow, whether it's ours or the Chinese economy or the Russian economy? Uh, where should money be invested? What regulations should we have over capital flows? Technical issues. Uh, how often is there you know, a compelling story about a world-shattering event in the newspapers anymore or in the evening news? It's mostly okay. There's a yes. We have there's an ethnic conflict over here, and we're fighting over you know uh, some issue with the Chinese about the border, or India and Pakistan are having a, a border conflict. But those are regional issues, and none of them carry the ideological impact that the world was used to through most of the 20th century. Whether it was the potential triumph of fascism in the 1930s and 40s, or the conflict between communism and capitalism in the second half of the 20th century, all of that is passe now. You know, now the issues are issues that are debated by economists and bureaucrats, and politics is essentially not very interesting anymore, uh, even in the American political system. You know, how far apart are Republican and Democratic uh, rivals? You know, they are busy you know, trying to be just like each other. Uh, so that we're going to be in a world that is largely managed by uh, bureaucrats, just as a corporation is managed by bureaucrats. And that's how world issues will be resolved, not by great conflicts, because there is no great disagreement on how the world should work anymore. Now, that's the argument that revolutions are over, and so is history. Here are an alternative set of ideas, hmm? and what I call the end or the beginning, hmm? because the argument that I've just given you argues that all of this tells us that revolutions and history have ended, uh, that the great ideological issues have ended, the great social political upheavals of the past century are behind us and we will not see their like again. However, there are, without making this a prediction, because as I said, historians aren't very good at predicting, uh, alternative interpretations of what is happening in the world. First of all, capitalism in and of itself inherently creates inequities in wealth. I mean, it's inevitable. Uh, in a market system, some people are going to succeed and some are going to fail. Uh, quite simply, look at the stock market. Uh, that's a market system. People participate in it. But many people are impoverished by the system, and others become quite wealthy. Inevitably, there are those extremes over time, no matter what. Not everyone is going to prosper as a result of this system. Just as when agriculture is commercialized in peasant economies, some people get very rich at it, some do moderately well, and some are failures. Private enterprise, you know, small businesses, half of all business, small businesses fail within the first five years. <laughs> their e-commerce, it's 90 percent. Um, inevitably, in a market system, in a capitalist system, you create great disparities of wealth, as we have seen in the past. Well, it is not the sole factor, disparities of wealth and increasing disparities of wealth, and that is happening in this society today. The distance between rich and poor, between the people at the bottom end of society and the top, has never been greater. The percentage of national wealth control by the top 5 percent of the American population in terms of income has never been greater than it is at this time. So the disparities are growing. Now, it is not just an issue of, well, that's the way capitalism is, that it creates these disparities. The fact is that in many societies, these societies have inherently had sharp disparities in wealth. And the introduction of capitalism only increases those disparities. 
in many societies, such as you look at societies in uh, Southern Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, India would be an example, the distance between rich and poor has always been great. And the fact is capitalism does very little to rectify that and, in fact, may make it worse. So here is combustible material for the future. There's no question about the potential. The reality may be another matter, but the potential for explosion uh, as a result of these growing disparities is truly there. Now, of course, the world economy has been growing over the last decade, an unusual period of prosperity for most of the world. So to see these disparities increasing even as wealth is increasing in these various nations has to suggest serious problems are going to arise when that growth, as it inevitably will, uh, stalls and even goes into a downward turn. What's going to happen in these societies when, in fact, the economy isn't growing and those disparities are still greater than ever before? There's also a political issue, and that is the limits of liberalism. Yes, we've seen countries turn towards electoral systems, such as Russia and many of the countries in Latin America today. Uh, but many of these so-called democracies or liberal regimes are what uh, we politely term guided democracies. In other words, they're not really free and open societies. Uh, if you look at Russia, for example, uh, the truth is a handful of people have largely dominated and controlled uh, the Russian political system for a number of years. The, the press is in no way free and is controlled largely by the state and the group in power. Uh, if you look in Latin America, you'll see regimes that are moving ever more towards dictatorial exercise of power despite the fact that technically they remain uh, elected governments. And we see the power of the military remains extremely strong in that part of the world uh, and is, can often not be touched or influenced by the existing constitutional regimes. And of course, in other parts of the world, uh, such as in China, uh, one even, wouldn't even pretend to suggest that these are in fact uh, open and representative types of government. So the idea of that liberalism has suddenly uh, exploded uh, in its growth and its uh, prevalence in the world uh, is largely uh, an illusion. What is true is that some of the great dictatorial regimes, the uh, totalitarian regimes uh, that marked the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe have crumbled, but that does not mean that democracy has necessarily flourished uh, in their place, that what we have very often is a modified form of autocracy where elections are held but often manipulated where the ability of the population to truly alter their political system is seriously circumscribed. So there are significant limits to the triumph of liberalism as described by those who would argue that in fact uh, the end of revolutions is upon us and indeed the end of history itself. There's another issue here. And that is that as we move towards a global economy, there are tremendous costs involved in this process. Globalization is often argued uh, is the principal means for future economic and growth and development across the globe. But in fact, as national economies around the world are more fully integrated with each other. The risks for serious economic catastrophe actually grow. Uh, we saw this in Asia over the last few years as the Asian economies went into a meltdown. Why? Because as the flow of capital has become more fluid, as it is easier to move billions of dollars from one economy to another because of a more open economic system. Uh, when any doubts arise about one particular economy, uh, such as places like Singapore and Malaysia, et cetera, Indonesia, uh, suddenly they will find themselves losing billions upon billions of dollars in investment uh, that are pulled out at the wink of an eye, at the snap of a finger, because it appears those economies may be moving in a downward direction. So while in the past barriers to capital movement seem to inhibit growth, the opening up of 
capital markets. It means that money can move that much faster around the globe and create situations where minor economic recessions can become true economic disasters. And it's not at all clear uh, that we have the institutions at our command, uh, either in the form of the IMF or the, you know, uh, Club of Paris, etc., all the different organizations that have been created over time to try to influence the world economy, that these groups can, in and of themselves, manage to cope uh, with such vast changes uh, in world economies that can occur so quickly and that can have such devastating effects. Uh, just a few decades ago, the major world banks were nearly toppled by a debt crisis in Latin America. They came perilously close to similar danger uh, with the Asian meltdown. And these are two situations where we're dealing with economies that are not the major or leading economies in the world. What if this happens in the United States? What if it happens in Japan? Uh, then you could see a real collapse of the world economic system. So globalization promotes economic growth, but it also means you've got a more integrated system, one in which economies are more sensitive to each other, where, yes, growth in China helps us, but a setback in the American economy ripples through the world. You know, the American stock market drops by 500 points. I can guarantee you all the major stock indices in the world are going to drop in a similar fashion. So yes, it promotes growth, but it also increases sensitivity, increases the possibilities for truly catastrophic collapse sometime in the future. We've also seen that globalization in its own way contributes to some of the ethnic conflicts uh, of the world around us. Well, many of these conflicts, uh, such as those that have occurred in Bosnia, etc., uh, have deep historical roots in their own right. Oftentimes, these conflicts are exacerbated by the disruptions caused by globalization. Uh, for example, uh, when you look at the former Yugoslavia and its uh, problems in recent years, one of the serious problems that helped exacerbate the conflicts and make them far more intense were the economic problems of Yugoslavia as it tried to adjust to rules set by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which was calling for less spending, for uh, the privatization of corporations that had been run by the previous uh, communist regime. All of this put the Yugoslav economy in an economic tailspin. In turn, as economic conditions worsened in the country, so did ethnic conflicts. So what globalization can often do, because of these disruptions that occur as countries try to pull themselves into the global system, is help exacerbate internal problems. Much as we saw in places like China and elsewhere in the 20th century, their conflicts over peasant rights, over workers, etc., were exacerbated by their attempts to more fully insert themselves into the global system. The same thing is happening today around the world, that as these countries try to more fully integrate themselves into the global market, they often suffer severe economic setbacks that can help trigger social upheaval. We've also seen around the globe reactions, continuing reactions, to the process of modernization and Americanization. As the Soviet Union collapsed, one of the ideologies that emerged with greater fervor than ever was Russian nationalism, a fear that Russia was being sold out to Americans and other Westerners. And indeed, Americans were pouring into Russia uh, with all kinds of programs, teaching people how to be businessmen, uh, taking over and developing university courses, and bringing thousands of Russians here to train them. A belief that Russian culture was going to be sold out as American culture was inserted, you know, McDonald's, on Red Square, et cetera, in Moscow, that our culture, our values, as different as they are from the Americans, will be swept aside, will be undermined by the influence of Americanization. We get the reaction of Russian nationalism and Islamic fundamentalism. We see this rise up in the Iranian revolution, and we have seen subsequent elements uh, emerge in other countries like Sudan, as these countries have a similar reaction, uh, in this case, based on their religious values against American influence, against those values I talked about in the first half of today's session. You know, ideas like consumerism, materialism, secularism, the idea that we should focus only on, you know, on the here and now and dealing with this world's problems, that the spiritual belongs uh, to the private sector of life, to one's own personal values and beliefs, but not in the public arena. These reactions are all reactions triggered to one degree or another by the process of integrating uh, 
economies and societies and cultures around the globe. That process has the capability of triggering violent reactions against these phenomena. Looking at the current world situation, we see continuing evidence of this process of upheaval. In Latin America, not since the 1960s, not since nearly 50 years ago, have there been such widespread mass mobilizations of peasants in places like Brazil, the movement of people without land. Uh, in Ecuador for a time, government being taken over uh, in part by a movement led by Indian peasants. Uh, here we see this mass mobilization of people who are losing out in the process of globalization. Because what is globalization? Globalization at the beginning of the 21st century is very much what it was at the beginning of the 20th century. And that is it's going to involve commercialization of agriculture, development of large commercial enterprise, large efficient modern factories and peasants and workers are frequently going to lose out in this process. They're going to see their way of life sacrificed. So we see again a process of mobilization of populations going on in various parts of the world as peasants react to this loss of land. We see nationalistic and Islamic revolutionary movements. Russia and northern Africa, places like Sudan and the Middle East, uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood that we talked about in Egypt uh, that emerged earlier in the 20th century is still very much a force in Egypt's uh, affairs today. And well, no other society has experienced quite the Islamic revolution uh, that uh, Iran has. Nevertheless, regimes in Egypt and particularly in Algeria uh, have been uh, challenged to a significant degree by these movements. And again, what is their focus? Much of it focuses on the question of their integration into a global society, their integration into the process of modernization, and how that conflicts with many of the values and beliefs that they hold central to their society. Now, to take these developments and suggest that you know, a revolution of massive proportions is somewhere near on the horizon uh, would be foolish at best, because this is only scattered evidence. It's, a series of incidents that one can draw various implications out of. But when you look at the impacts of globalization and the potential for economic problems, and then look at the variety of reactions from you know, Russian nationalism, Yugoslav nationalism, to peasant mobilizations, uh, to Islamic fundamentalism, it's clear that the potential at least exists for revolutionary movements. What is lacking at this point is a set of ideas that will draw these movements together. But we've seen uh, in recent years an effort to refashion a set of revolutionary concepts that might challenge this process. Recent demonstrations against the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, challenging the very idea of globalization and trying to formulate an alternative strategy and philosophy and ideology, if you will. Now, the potential is there uh, because of upheaval in societies through much of the globe, we see this challenge to the process of globalization. The at least potential is there at the level of social unrest, whether the ideology will emerge uh, to give purpose and direction to this upheaval on a larger scale than peasant uprisings or specific incidents of revolutionary nationalism uh, is yet to be seen. But I think one thing is a constant here that as the process of globalization continues, the spread of capitalism through the globe, its more great intense penetration of societies around us, the potential for revolution increases as well. Uh, finally, let me conclude with a quote from the German playwright Bertolt Brecht, uh, who once said, it is not communism that is revolutionary, but capitalism. And this is just what Brecht was talking, talking about, that capitalism, the process of modernization, globalization, however you want to term it, with its incredible ability to raise material production, but at the same time to radically alter the lives, the cultures of people in this world, has created the greatest potential and reality for revolution of any force in human history. And its continued spread and penetration around the globe suggests that at least the potential, the possibilities for revolution remain very much alive 
here at the beginning of the 21st century. Okay, now for the part that everybody really wants to hear. <laughs> What's on the exam? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, but I am going to tell you how to study for it and how to organize your material so you can focus on some of the things that are most significant. First of all, let me break things down briefly between the first part of the course where we looked at early modern revolutions and then modern revolutions and just make some distinctions because they are valuable in organizing uh, for the final. Remember, the final is only going to include modern revolutions. But let me make these distinctions and it will help set a framework for what we're going to talk about as we review some specifics. First of all, we looked at early modern revolutions, meaning the English Civil War, the French Revolution, the American Revolution. These revolutions tended to occur in core societies, meaning those societies that were going to lead the world in development over the next several centuries. Western Europe, the United States, these were the core societies. This is where capitalism was getting started, where it would first flourish and then come to influence the rest of the world. These are the societies that have pretty much dominated uh, developments in the world economy in the past several centuries. These are the core societies. What we had in these early modern revolutions was the end of the existing state and social order. And what was the existing state and social order? It was a feudal order, a system of dynastic rule. The United States was, you know, the American colonies were an extension of that, subjects of the uh, English crown. So it was a feudal system, a monarchical system, uh, that these revolutions challenge, and also a feudal social and economic order, a system of tribute, you know, peasants paying tribute uh, to their landlords uh, based on feudal agreements and feudal dues that had evolved down through the centuries ever since the fall of the Roman Empire, and a system that helped fuel with those dues and that tribute uh, the dynastic systems that ruled over these societies. So this was the basic social and political order, and one that was marked, of course, by distinctions in terms of human beings and their rights and privileges, all of which were grounded in birth. You know, whether one was born to the nobility, whether one was born as a peasant, that pretty much dictated one's scope of opportunities for the rest of your existence. What is coming into place and pushing aside this feudal order is the emergence of capitalism whether it's commercialization of agriculture uh, through enclosure in England, through the imposition of feudal dues with the purpose of making profits in France, we have the rise of capitalism in agriculture and then later the early signs of the Industrial Revolution as artisans become more competitive and enter into a market system. All of that raises a series of challenges to the existing mode of production to its political order, this dynastic system of control from the top, allegedly with the blessing of the divine, to a social system which did not place emphasis on careers open to talent, but careers based on one's birth, and with a system that depended primarily on tribute as a means of economic growth rather than a system designed to promote efficiency and improvement in the agricultural and industrial ventures. All of that was challenged by emerging capitalism, that the state in the future could no longer have control over property and do as it chose, grant property or take it away. You saw that in the English Civil War in particular. That the social order would be one with careers open to talent and that the primary purpose of industrial and agricultural endeavors was to increase efficiency and to generate profits. These were the basic driving forces of change in these early revolutions. And at the same time as, commercial, as capitalism began to emerge in these societies, so to, mm, did alternatives to capitalism. And we saw some of these examples with the Jacobins, you know, Robespierre, mm. uh, the leaders of the French intelligentsia and artisans, the sans culottes, who wanted to try to create a system uh, that was an alternative capitalism with price controls, uh, which would preserve the old artisan order, for example. And the levelers and the diggers in the English Civil War trying to fight off enclosure and the commercialization of artisan enterprise. Now, 
the heart of the matter, modern revolutions. What are the basic characteristics? They have occurred in peripheral societies, certain societies that did not experience these early revolutions, that had not fully entered the process of capitalism, capitalist development and modernization. Most of them represented by autocratic modernizing states. We talked about this in the first half. Not everyone, every revolution, modern revolution can be characterized quite that way. Uh, even China to some degree, if you want to count the nationalists as the autocratic modernizers, I suppose you could. Uh, but generally this does tend to be a characteristic that you have a top-down, if you want to call it dictatorial, authoritarian uh, political system, not closely in touch with the local elites, Mexico, prime example, Russia was another one I gave earlier on, trying to modernize its society. And so we're doing, it sets off conflict, conflict it is not fully prepared to control because its own linkages to its own society, its ability to command the loyalty of large landowners, nobility, what have you, is not very effective. That is a deadly combination for these regimes, trying to modernize while at the same time you're an autocratic regime that is not in close touch with your own elites. We also saw an important factor in external political and economic domination. And again, this could take a variety of forms. When we look at the case of Vietnam, classic case of colonialism, outright and total political and economic domination by the French. Most other cases are far more subtle in form. China under the treaty port system, Russia with its dependence upon foreign capitalists, uh, the relationship between Cuba and the United States, with the United States having enormous political and economic power without actually uh, creating colony out of Cuba. This is another critical factor because it is a strong motivation for nationalist uprisings to throw off foreign control. It's also important not just from the point of view of stimulating a nationalist reaction, but because also, well, there are initiatives towards capitalism internally. We see that in Russia, we see that in China, we see that elsewhere. While there are these internal initiatives, the reality is that much of the most powerful initiative in places like Russia, in places like Cuba and Mexico, was coming from the outside. In other words, when modern industrial enterprise was being created, more often than not, it was foreigners who were doing it. In Russia, you know, 60 percent or more of the invested capital uh, that's being developed in Russia is coming from the outside. So capitalism is not simply something that is evolving naturally on its own within these societies. Instead, there is this vastly accelerated and highly concentrated process. This exacerbates the disruptions caused by capitalism. We saw it occur at a much slower pace in the early modern revolutions. Here you can take that and where it was telescoped out in the case of France and England over centuries. Here you're talking about in 50 years we've gone from being you know, a peasant society and now we've got these modern industrial plants employing thousands of workers in St. Petersburg and Moscow. In Mexico, same kind of thing. Take the Diaz regime from 1876 to 1900 in a 25-year period this massive increase in commercialized agriculture controlled by Americans, railroad systems built by Americans, power plants, factories, et cetera, et cetera. So you're exacerbating the disruptions of capitalist development because it's occurring so fast. And you also feed into this nationalist reaction from workers and peasants because they see foreigners as the source of this problem. So very often in these revolutions, the two are combined, nationalism and anti-capitalism or anti-modernism they are seen as one because in these societies, who has brought the primary change through capitalism? It's been foreigners. Finally, in all of the modern revolutions, well, I shouldn't say all of them because, of course, Iran is the exception, uh, but most of these revolutions, there is a Marxist inspiration, a Marxist ideology. In Mexico, there are strong elements of Marxism and anarcho-syndicalism, although that is not the group that comes to dominate the revolution in the long run. But if we look at Russia, we look at China, we look at Vietnam, you look at Cuba and Nicaragua, all of these take their basic ideological inspiration from Marx. With Mexico, you have 
the influence of leftist ideologies, particularly anarcho-syndicalism, but the groups that eventually triumph and control the revolutionary state are not wedded to those specific ideas. And of course, in Iran, we have an Islamic Republic created. But five out of the seven, clearly, this is Marxist-based ideology. They may modify Marx. They had to because it didn't quite fit their pattern. You know, Mao had to deal with the fact that he was building a peasant revolution, not a proletarian revolution, but he still was inspired by Marx's ideas about class conflict and about creating an ideal communist society. And of course, Russia, that is the basic inspiration of the Bolshevik Revolution. But Marxist ideology is the primary, the most influential ideology in the modern revolutionary movements. So there we have a capsule summary. Now, how do you go about studying all this stuff? Let me emphasize, first of all, that I'm not going to cover every fact. I'm not even going to cover every revolution in this part about history. But I'm trying to focus you on what are the most important elements to look at. Take this material, go over it before you review your notes. Okay? And that will help guide you through all of this stuff. You know, you've got weeks and weeks of notes, you know, dealt with seven different revolutions here. How are you going to get it under control so you can answer a question on the final exam? First of all, one possible area for a question is history. How did the historical development of each of these countries contribute to the outbreak of revolution? Okay. That is a logical question. At the same time, of the seven, there are certain ones that lend themselves more to this type of question than others because their history had such a powerful impact uh, on the outbreak and the character of the revolution. And here I'm giving you, you know, these are the four. If I was going to ask a question just on history, these will be one of these four. Now, does not mean, well, gee, I don't have to look at the history of China. Yeah, don't have to look at the history of Nicaragua because you didn't put that on the list. If I ask a question about history alone, it'd be one of these. But that does not exclude the possibility that I'd ask you to compare history and several other factors. But if I ask just a question on history, it'd be one of these, and these are the factors you need to look at. Okay? If we ask about the history of these countries, what you want to think about are what are the central historical developments that shape these revolutions? What is it in their historical development that brought these revolutions about that gave it certain distinctive qualities in terms of the actual revolutions themselves? Russia. And what is distinctive in Russia's history? First of all, it's an autocracy. Yeah. Going back to our talk of causation. It is an autocracy that is clearly out of touch with its own population, as seen in the 1905 revolution, both in the sense that it suppresses its peasants because it has no sympathy or understanding for them, and at the same time faces the real danger that the elite may not support them, the nobility, because the nobility sees that it has no real place in the new world that the czarist regime is trying to create. Secondly, serfdom. Serfdom helps create a sense of disentitlement and a sense of estrangement within rural society in Russia. Here, at a time in the modern world, in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, where peasants elsewhere are actually making some advances, here Russian peasants are being suppressed, are being alienated, and even when serfdom is abolished in the 1860s, it's largely for the purpose of trying to accelerate the exploitation of the peasant population, to exploit them more efficiently, to produce more goods. And in the end, will lead to a breakup or an attempt to break up the traditional peasant pattern of agriculture and create a modern agricultural system. Another distinctive feature of Russia's history is the all-powerful nature of the state. We talked about early modern revolutions and dynasties such as those in France and England, but neither of them could rival the power that the Tsarist regime exercised down through the centuries. Remember the Russian government, the Tsarist government comes into 
uh, its own, essentially by using its military might over the centuries to ward off invaders and various elements causing disruption, and at the same time creates this acutely autocratic order where the Tsar is virtually all-powerful. The Tsar has power beyond that ever imagined by Louis XIV or Louis XVI or Charles II or any other uh, dynastic ruler in Western Europe. Uh, he has control over the church, control over the nobility. He creates them or destroys them as he chooses. Uh, the Tsar of Russia is all-powerful. This is another factor because, again, it breaks down any possibilities of linkages between the autocracy, between the dynasty, and the various power groups within society. Because ultimately, they only have two choices. Either they bend to the will of the Tsar, or they cease to exist. That creates extremes of political power. And just as in the Soviet Union in the 20th century, that type of system is ultimately untenable because you give your opponents no choice. They either have to become all-out opponents, or they have to submit to your rule. This is, helps promote a more extreme resolution of problems in Russia because there are no alternative means essentially for negotiating reforms and change uh, between the regime and those who are ruled. As we saw, Russia is also a classic example of this autocracy which tries to modernize its own society while being in such poor touch with the power brokers within its own society and in the process alienating, further alienating those groups. Modernization leaves the nobility out. They can't compete in commercial agriculture, or many of them can't. They are losing their jobs in the bureaucracy. As far as the peasantry go, they are being forced into new enterprises focused on commercial agriculture, even as it remains technically peasant agriculture, uh, which further alienates them from the regime as well. As far as the intelligentsia, as we just said, in this all-powerful czarist regime, there is no place for people like Lenin and others uh, to become open and safe critics of the regime. It's either submit or rebel. All of those activities alienate vast parts of the population. And of course, the proletariat, the critical factor in the end, in these massive foreign factories that are created, uh, they suffer deprivations in terms of working conditions and salaries or in wages, and ultimately they will provide the initial impetus for the successful revolution. Then there are other factors that are not as significant, but still help trigger the revolution. One is war, the First World War, which Russia is a colossal failure at, uh, and worsens the economic conditions to the point where they are simply un insufferable for the vast majority of the Russian population and where enormous casualties are being suffered. This ultimately provides the complete delegitimization of the regime. No longer can anyone seriously argue that this regime has a right to power in Russia after the catastrophe of World War I. And of course, the regime has contributed to this problem by its own incompetence. When you look back at Nicholas and Alexander and Rasputin, uh, you realize there were people managing this vast empire who would have trouble managing their own household estate, never mind a huge nation and a world war. So all of these factors combined, war and incompetence are contributing elements, but as these other historical factors which really help bring on revolution in Russia and give it some of its uh, characteristics. Why do the Bolsheviks move towards uh, their own form of autocracy, namely a totalitarianism? In part because Russia had long been characterized historically by these extremes of political power. Once you're in power, the answer is you don't share power, you don't negotiate. <laughs> you suppress your enemies. Cuba. Again, historical factors that mark Cuba and help bring about its revolution. Cubans as second-class citizens. Talked about Cuba as a Spanish colony right down to 1898. Even in that time, even before the coming of the Americans, the fact that Spaniards born in Spain dominated the political bureaucracy, the colonial uh, administrative order, and the economy, as well as the Catholic Church, so that Cubans born in Cuba feel as though they really don't have a place in their own society. That sense is going to be reinvigorated 
by the coming of the Americans. They won't create a colony, but they will pour into Cuba's economy, dominate the major aspects of the economy, sugar, banking, etc. And at the same time, in their employment practices, largely dismiss or denigrate Cubans. So that once again, even though they are no longer a colony, Cubans feel as though they are second class citizens in their own society. And this kind of sense of alienation plays an important role ultimately in both the 1933, but particularly the 1959 revolution, the sense of wanting to reassert control over their own society. The disparities in wealth in Cuba, we talked about this as a product of uh, external development of economies, of globalization, etc., that you get great disparities of wealth as certain parts of the economy are developed by capitalist enterprise, but the rest of society and the rest of the population is left behind. In the case of Cuba specifically, you have this tremendous development of sugar, both in the 19th and the 20th centuries. But sugar does not require a consumer economy. All of this is being done for export. So the population of rural Cuba remains desperately poor. There's no motivation uh, for foreign investors who want to produce sugar uh, to improve the lot of the average rural Cuban worker. What they want is the cheapest set of hands that they can get uh, to run their mills and work the fields, and that means even bringing in Haitians from the outside, another reminder to Cubans that they were second-class citizens. So you have this tremendous disparity in wealth, that the island's economy is going to grow, Havana becomes this great metropolitan center, but the rural population, the bulk of the population, lives in the countryside. They are desperately poor, and there is no group in power in Cuba up to the time of the revolution that has any motivation to rectify that situation because sugar can prosper in the midst of poverty. In fact, it prospers in part because of the poverty, because labor is so cheap. And of course, the reliance on a single product, on monoculture, the production and export of sugar, creates these incredible roller coaster rides in the economy itself. Cuban sugar prices skyrocket during World War I, collapse after the war, uh, and Cuba is constantly experiencing this you know, rising and falling, this boom and bust economy because of its reliance on a single product. U.S. economic domination and Americanization exacerbate the conditions that already existed in Cuba. They exacerbate the sense of alienation that Cubans have, the sense of being dominated by foreigners, first Spaniards and now Americans. And the Americans take it even further because it's not just a matter of economic domination. They really want to change Cubans. They want to make them into Americans. They want to you know, teach them how to speak English. They want to change their uh, school system and their judicial system, uh, teach them to be modern American workers, highly competitive and individualistic, uh, all of this an anathema uh, to Cuba's own culture and history. Ultimately, the dominance which the Americans exercise in Cuba is such that Cuba really lacks a, an effective ruling elite of its own. One of the things that makes the Cuban Revolution possible and distinctive in many ways, we talked in other revolutions about uh, conflicts between our alliances between, let's say, the middle class and working class, or peasants and middle class groups, if you look at Vietnam and Russia, et cetera. Here, the revolution succeeds in large measure because groups are so divided and atomized by this process that there really is no coalition of forces to prevent the revolution, to challenge what Castro ultimately chooses to do with the revolution. For example, the local elites have been completely dependent upon the American economy and upon American business. When that begins to disappear, so do they. Unions, uh, representatives of the working class, had largely been a part of the old Batista regime, negotiating with that old regime for benefits. When that is gone, they have no real power of their own. They're not used to organizing strikes and demonstrations uh, to get their way. Uh, they will follow the revolution because, in fact, they do not have a distinct leadership of their own uh, that can chart a course. 
In this case, we have a revolution which succeeds largely because the society is so divided, so atomized, so fractured by this long domination by external forces, particularly the Americans, that it's a tabula rasa. It's a blank slate upon which the revolutionaries can write the future. Vietnam. Here we have one of the cases that of a revolution heavily influenced by foreign domination, specifically colonialism. That much of the revolution, as I said earlier, is focused on this nationalistic agenda. And it's hard to say, is Vietnam more of a Marxist revolution or a nationalist revolution? But clearly, that struggle to achieve independence is fundamental to understanding the Vietnamese revolution. And not just because of French colonialism, but because of this very long history that we traced of its relationship with China and the repeated initiatives by the Vietnamese down through the centuries to assert their independence of China. And then a reaffirmation of that same desire, of course, once the French come and create a colonial system. And then finally, with the Americans in the South, that simply reminds the Vietnamese once again that they are the subject, the target of foreign influence and control. Maybe not colonialism as in the past, but to them, the Americans are foreign invaders, much as the French and the Chinese before them. Another contributing factor uh, is internal instability within Vietnam. For all of the accomplishments of uh, the Vietnamese in throwing off Chinese domination, we also saw that Vietnam itself was often divided between North and South, or as many as three different regimes, dynastic struggles. This is what allowed, for example, the Ming Dynasty to reassert Chinese control temporarily, and it's certainly what allowed the French uh, to intervene in the middle of the 19th century, backing one side over another and using that was internal divisions in Vietnam, exploiting them to the maximum in order to impose French control from the outside. One of the major impacts of French colonialism is a central causal factor of the revolution, and that is, again, commercialization of agriculture, where the peasant population, especially in the South, uh, where the opportunities for commercial agriculture are greater, simply because of the topography, that here we have this massive loss of land by peasants. And this is in direct contradiction to what Vietnam had been like down through the centuries where peasant villages controlled much of the land in the countryside and had a considerable degree of independence, at least in the management of their own affairs on a day-to-day -day basis, that they were not subject to uh, direct control by landlords who owned most of the land, that peasants had tremendous amounts of land, and landlords, local no members of the nobility, were largely uh, tribute collectors. Now, that whole relationship has been reversed as land is lost, and this new landowning elite is created, and peasants are without land. They become a major triggering factor. And of course, the middle class. As the French educated middle class, but then failed to create the employment opportunities that will make it possible for those people to prosper, this middle class becomes the central element in leading the revolutionary forces. We see them try to do that in movements like the nationalist movement, but more successfully, ultimately, in the communist movement. These are disaffected elements of the middle class who have been, in some ways, brought into existence by the French through education, but left without hope for the future by a lack of opportunity. And finally, the revolution as reaction to the American mission. You know, this American mission of Americanization, of trying to transform at least southern Vietnam into a society that approximates American society and its values. That gave fresh fuel to the last phase of the Vietnamese Revolution, the struggle in the South against American influence and control. And finally, the fourth case of Iran. And here we do have, again, some distinctive features. Just as with Russia, we have to keep in mind such things as the all-powerful nature of the state. Here, it is fundamental to understand the influence of Shiism, that branch of uh, Islam that was dominant in Iran down through the centuries, ever since the time of the Safavid Empire and really before that, uh, a branch of Islam that put particular emphasis on the importance of uh, the control of religious leaders over the political process. 
Now this helped set the stage for conflict between the clergy and the succeeding regimes, dynasties that control Iran, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries. And that comes out especially in this triadal relationship between the dynasty, foreign interests, and local power brokers. Those local power brokers include, of course, the clergy, but also uh, merchants, the bazaaris, and landowners. The local power brokers trying to preserve their influence that they had enjoyed, particularly since uh, the early part of the 18th century with the collapse of the old Safavid uh, Empire and Safavid dynasty. The regime trying to centralize and, of course, in the 20th century, modernize and looking towards foreign interests, first the British and then the Americans, to help it do so, whether we're talking about the Gahar dynasty or the Pahlavi dynasty after it. So we get a classic case of autocratic modernization. At the same time, we have this very important conflict over religious values and over cultural issues. For both the mullahs, the ulama, ulema, the Islamic clergy, and the bazaaris, the merchant class, this is a fundamental issue, as it is with much of the peasantry. And particularly as the 20th century progresses, particularly in, uh, from the 1950s on, as the Shah pushes this program of modernization, a rejection of Western values and ideas. Now, besides history, what can we talk about? Comparison of revolutions. And here I'm going to do all of the revolutions just briefly. First of all, how do we split these up? How should you organize? Take this idea, that Russia, Iran, and Mexico share a common causal factor of autocratic modernization, autocratic states trying to modernize talked about this and mentioned it repeatedly as a causal factor. So if we take these three together, how would we then compare them, saying that they have that, at least that common causal feature in terms of revolution? Then let's look at the other elements and see how they play in. In terms of agents, to what extent are peasants versus proletarians important? In Russia, proletarians are particularly important. In Iran, in Mexico, both groups, both peasants and proletarians, the proletarians in Iran, I mean, you know, the urban poor who come in and are unable to find work in an urban setting. In those two revolutions, it's really an equal mix of both groups. The middle class is particularly relevant in the revolution in Russia and the revolution in Mexico. They provide the leadership of the successful revolutionary movements, the intelligentsia, the constitutionalists. Uh, these are the people that are central in leading these revolutionary battles. So there, the agents are similar. In the case of Iran, we have to throw in this distinction, that here, the religious clergy, which are, and it's difficult to distinguish them as middle class, et cetera, we simply have to say, look, at here, religious leaders played a central role that we don't find anywhere else, certainly not in these other two revolutions. Goals. All of these revolutions ultimately seek modernization it, to the extent that modernization means material accomplishments on a level equal to those of other modern societies. At least one of the revolutions in the Russian Revolution sought socialism as a way of achieving that without creating the disparities so common in capitalist societies. In Mexico, the alternative was state capitalism, with the state playing the major role in promoting economic growth, but encouraging private enterprise as well. The state will control the oil economy, utilities, but private enterprise can industrialize, even foreigners are welcome to back in. And then finally, Iran, yes, they too want a modern, material society in the sense of material accomplishments, but they want to achieve it through an Islamic social and political and ethical order, with the rule of the clergy itself tempering this process and avoiding the materialism and secularism of the West. Finally, effects. In Russia, we get communism, the Soviet state. In Mexico, we get state capitalism were spelled right with another A, uh, which I've just described to you. And also nationalism, which influences all three 
not only Mexico, but Russia and Iran. We see it particularly in Mexico, though, this assertion of throwing off American influence and domination. As far as effects, Iran again stands out as an Islamic society as opposed to uh, the types of socialist or state capitalist societies that were created elsewhere. And again, all are trying to achieve modernization, but modernization in a narrow sense, uh, and not in the sense of all the ideas that Americans hold as part of modernization, individualism, competitiveness, but modernization in the sense of creating uh, the material wealth, the material prosperity that they see in developed societies. Now, how do we group the others? Vietnam, Cuba, I'm throwing, I put Nicaragua in parentheses because I'm not really going to talk about Nicaragua here, but it's very similar to Cuba and much of what I have to say. And China, all characterized by foreign domination. Okay? We're looking for a common factor. Before it was autocratic modernization and the other three cases, in this four cases, a common causal factor that helps group these together is they're all anxious to throw off foreign domination. Colonialism, treaty ports, or U.S. influence. In these cases, peasants in the middle class are critical, particularly Vietnam and China. Only in Cuba could we really argue that working class people, uh, people that worked in the sugar mills and the power plants, uh, played a significant role. But as I said, in Cuba, the real issue is that we have an atomized society uh, that the revolutionaries are able to take advantage of, rather than talking about powerful revolutionary agents, you know, peasants, middle class, etc. But certainly in China and Vietnam, uh, and even in Nicaragua, peasants and the middle class are the groups that really make these revolutions. As far as goals of the revolutions, all of them seek national liberation. This is a vital goal in all of these revolutions, to free themselves of this foreign domination. All of them seek some form of socialism, some means by which the state will adjust resources to avoid inequities that inevitably occur in trying to achieve a modern society. And all of them in varying degrees, but particularly in China and in Vietnam, will put great emphasis on proprietorship of land by peasants, trying to restore the old order to some degree in some modern form. Where peasant communities will control the land. And finally, in terms of effects, we see in all of these cases, yes, the end of either imperialism or foreign domination, however you want to call it, uh, whether it's the U.S. or, you know, uh, European powers in China, the French in Vietnam, and then the Americans later on, all of them achieved that goal, throwing off foreign domination. They all succeed in the process in creating independent nation states that really had not existed before. Even Cuba, because of the Platt Amendment, didn't really have, and subsequent influence by the U.S., even after the Platt Amendment was abolished, didn't really have true national independence. All of them achieved that goal. All of them make some headway towards creating a socialist society. Whether that becomes permanent or not, as we've seen, most of them have headed towards some form of state capitalism since then. But all of them initiate socialist societies with the state redistributing wealth, you know, creating free health care and education, housing, etc. We see in all cases some attempts, although Cuba would be different in the sense that it doesn't have a full peasant population, but the other three certainly make a serious effort to create peasant proprietorship, to restore land to peasants who had lost it. In the case of Cuba, it's more a question of meeting the needs of the rural proletariat, the hundreds of thousands of people who worked on the sugar plantations, who were not interested so much in re uh, restoration of land, uh, most of them had never had it to begin with, but rather in better living and working conditions. And then finally, again, almost a truism now, this effort to achieve modernization, to achieve a level of material development comparable to what they had seen in the most advanced societies of the world at the time of these revolutions in the latter part of the 20th century. Okay, so what do you do with these pieces? With the histories, go back, look over the outline that I've given for each of the four histories and how they influence the revolution, and then read over your historical notes so you can 
remember some facts to help substantiate those major points that I made. As to the other two histories that I didn't get into, such as China, you should read those notes over and be somewhat familiar with them. I might still, for example, if I don't ask a question on history per se, I might still ask a question that says, look, I'd compare the history causes and effects of these two or three revolutions. So you'd have to know some of the history of the other two. But those outlines will help you organize. You know, when you look at these revolutions, can you characterize them in terms of what are the distinctive features in their historical development that contributed to the revolutions? So start with that outline, then go through the notes and study the notes on each of the histories in that way. For the other two, read through the notes and be able to characterize at least briefly what their histories were like and how they contributed to the revolution. But with those four, you've got a clear outline. If I ask a question on just on history alone, it'll come from one of those four. For the rest, it will be some type of comparative question. I've broken out the revolutions between causations focused on autocratic modernization and foreign domination, and then listed the key characteristics. If I ask a question, and I will almost inevitably ask a question that says, OK, take these two revolutions and compare them in terms of causes, goals, and effects, here you've got an outline. Before you read through the material on the revolutions themselves, study the outline. That will give you the basis for reading over your notes. This is the outline for the questions that I will ask. If you can put facts to this outline, you can answer any question. Maybe a question on history, there will definitely be a question that is comparative in nature. I ask you to compare two or three revolutions in terms of things such as causes, goals, and effects. You've got the outlines here. Now go back and read your notes. Use the outline as the basis for the questions that you're going to be asked, because I'm going to shape the questions based on the outline. With that information, you should do fine. That's it. Thanks very much.